Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another Strategy in Practice session uh, on a very special topic, the evolution of work in a post-COVID world. We are re really excited to welcome you to this session, and we thank you for joining us today. My name is George Karuvala, and I'm a global strategist within our strategic advisory group. And joining me today is a very special group of leaders from various industries here to share their thoughts on how our notion of work has evolved over the past 12 months thanks to the pandemic. They'll also discuss some key lessons that they've learned. From a logistics perspective, over the course of the next hour or so, we will have three sections covering the most pertinent topics. As questions come up, please post them in the chat window and we'll address them throughout the session. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Luis, do you wanna kick us off? Thank you, George. My name is Luis Canepari. I'm the uh, Newman's Chief Information Officer. I've been in uh, the company since uh, um, 20, uh, uh, 2012. Um, uh, it's been a great experience for me. Uh, uh, Newman is one of the largest gold mining companies in the world. Uh, we have operations in, uh, in uh, over uh, 12 countries, in, uh, uh, ranging from Africa to Australia and South America and, uh, North, and North America. Thanks, Louise. Uh, Caroline, you want to go next? Sure. My name is Caroline Martorano, and I am the Director of Support Operations and Infrastructure at Baxter Credit Union. We're a financial industry located just outside of Chicago. Um, been here for 15 years and um, have been working with our, our Citrix team for many of those years. And this has been a big, big shift for us from a financial industry perspective. Thanks for joining us, Caroline. Brett? Yeah, thanks, George. Um, Brett Erickson, I head up the domain services and application virtualization team within IHS Market. Uh, see, I've been here for about two and a half years, but I've been in IT for uh, right around 25 years, uh, working with Citrix and other EUC technologies for probably the last 10. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with IHS Market, we're an information services company uh, that has products and expertise in uh, just about every uh, industry across the world. Uh, we have around 15,000 employees across 130 different countries. So remote access is always a, a hot topic for us that we're happy to talk about. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Brett. And last but not the least, Safi. Thanks, George. So my name's Safi Obadilla. I'm the field CTO at Citrix. I've uh, been at Citrix now coming on 11 years, but um, have been working with Citrix and end user computing technologies for over 25. Um, and it's I think we had a really interesting juncture right now in terms of where the future of work is going. So looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks again, Safi. So thank you once again to all of our panelists for joining us to share their insights. Uh, let's start the discussion with this notion of hybrid work. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, working from home was generally the exception within most organizations for a majority of the employees. However, the past year has forced that paradigm to fundamentally change. You keep hearing of companies shifting completely to a remote work model or embracing the hybrid work model. You hear of employees moving from cities to suburbs or in some cases to other states to lower the cost of living. And throughout that process, organizations have seen have realized significant operational savings, and in many cases also reduced their carbon footprint. So much so that hybrid work is here to stay and part of the long-term strategy for many. What are your thoughts on this topic? And Luis, perhaps you can kick us off on this one. Um, thank, thank you, George. And uh, I think I speak for everyone. I mean, uh, COVID has significantly changed the way that we all work, right? I mean, it's not a uh, uh, not only mining, but in every industry out there. I mean, I don't think that I have walked to the bank in, uh, in about a year now. <laughs> so everything that we do is, uh, is completely changed from our personal lives to the way that we interact with our, uh, the, the way our kids go to school and, uh, and uh, even the way that we socialize with our friends and, uh, and families, right? So uh, uh, it's been an incredible journey for us. And Newman, uh, look, we're always re-examining the way that we work. And uh, I think this was an um, eye-opener. I mean, uh, before we always had people working in uh, hoteling and uh, uh, technical people that work from home, but they were the minority. Now this whole switch to the majority of the people work remotely. And uh, only if you're needed in the mine, uh, you need to be at the site. Uh, it's a complete change in paradigms and how we, we operate. And uh, that has put a lot of pressure in the technology department. I mean, we have uh, had to adapt. And uh, um, I joke with my team that we went from, uh, you know, supporting uh, 
uh, people at the office to now running a logistics company, sending equipment all over the world, trying to keep people connected and, uh, and uh, uh, delivering new equipment to them when they need it, right? So um, very huge difference in, uh, in the way that we operate. And uh, uh, I, I know you mentioned that, that a lot of companies are reducing cost. And yes, we can see that, right? I mean, uh, footprints in our office space are being reduced and, uh, and uh, some of those operating expenses are reducing, like travel time. And uh, like, I, I haven't uh, flown to any of our sites in, uh, in uh, several months, right? Uh, uh, that certainly, uh, improve cost uh, uh, cost but uh, also there's other uh, costs are really transforming in my opinion you no longer need people flying to the sites but now you need more technology to support that work remotely so uh, we are investing in more technologies we're imbe- we, uh, we're investing in new ways to do our uh, work remotely and uh, and uh, that shift in cost is uh, I don't know if it's going to be equal but uh, but it's certainly a transformation of cost not a, not a complete elimination of, uh, of cost out of the uh, out of the uh, enterprise. <laughs> Great insights, Luis. Um, Caroline, you want to go next? Sure. Um, so it's interesting being in the financial industry, we push very much the digital space and digital um, is the new way. And we want our members to operate digitally. And the world of the branch um, is a a lot of times is secondary. And for Baxter Credit Union specifically, we are, we are very um, branch heavy in some areas, but really push digital. So when it came time for hybrid work, um, it was a big shift for us because we didn't operate the way we um, have our members operate. It is our culture to be in the office. And so the shift of hybrid, um, was almost not a foreign concept, but very foreign to us um, from a culture perspective. And so from a management perspective, it became very different on how we manage everybody fully remote and coming back into a hybrid model. How do you manage it differently? How do you keep your culture? How do we Um, have conversations and be okay just having coffee talk because we're not all around the coffee machine? How do you um, make each other feel like we're still um, friends, right? Versus just calling to talk about work. So it's been very interesting of um, shifting to the hybrid model of when people come into the office, when people are at home, um, Our senior management team has really taken a big shift in in understanding what it means to be be hybrid and to have people at home. Um, Our technology certainly enabled us to do it, and I I feel very lucky that we were able to do that. But it brings on a whole lot of um, different ways to to manage, to deliver work, to communicate, um, and then as, as uh, George and Louis um, mentioned, cost. And how do we shift cost? And are we thinking about um, different ways to apply those costs? Because we all know all of our companies, we, we spend a lot of time traveling and going to conferences or going to various sites, which is still really, really important, but we're able to do more now with those remote sites because we're all virtual and it has brought a very different perspective from our management pers- from our management team to be able to truly integrate those branch employees and our um, handful of work from home employees that we had prior to COVID to truly engaging them. And the, the work model continues to evolve. We, um, for the first handful of months, it was just get everybody home and make sure they they are safe and they can manage their home life with work. Um, and it has truly shifted to how do we operate this way and how do we take advantage of the benefits and lots of conversations about um, coming back and how do we keep um, those that are not coming back or those that have chosen to move during this pandemic, which they never would have thought of before. And we've had several of those um, um, over the course of the last year. My role um, being in IT support and operations has been very hands-on. And so we manage desktop support. And 
I usually can walk right over to your desk and help you with that. And so the hybrid model has 100% changed that. And um, our employees have had to handle a little bit more of the hands-on because we can't be at their home to touch, see, feel. And so it's been a great thing too, because um, it, it's developing processes and procedures that we communicate more and, and don't take for granted that we can just get to everybody. And so the model has absolutely shifted a lot of our processes and procedures so that we can support hybrid. Um, but it's continuing to evolve and it will, I think, forever continue to evolve. Um, but it's been a really positive shift for us after we've, you know, got over the send everybody home and make sure everybody's safe. So Brett, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so for me, I think that one of the things that's been most interesting, so I, I think all of us are in this space, right? Because we, we kind of like the technology and I, I think all of us have kind of seen where it's going. So I think this this whole hybrid work scenario has kind of been, in my opinion, anyway, the natural progression of things. I, I think what COVID did uh, in my mind is kind of accelerate the timelines, right? I, I think for us internally here, uh, you know, we kind of hit that moment in, in early last year. Where I was like, you know, this is coming can our systems handle it? So it's, you know, there was a lot of work and a lot of scrambling to, to see what it was now going to look like to have 15,000 people working from home and trying to get ahead of that before it became mandated rather than, you know, just a, an exception to the normal work processes. So, you know, I, I think once we kind of got over that initial fear and realized that we can work in this model, uh, it is pre presented some, some other additional uh, scenarios. And I think Lewis touched on a bit, I think all of the benefits we've seen from it, there's also come uh, some challenges too that we've had to overcome, right? So hiring flexibility was was one of the the benefits, right? So you know normally we we've had our hiring practices around some of these big uh, uh, metropolitan areas or some of our bigger offices, and that's kind of where you looked, right? Well, now you don't we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, but the the challenges that you face then is then how does your whole if your whole salary structure is based around you know location and then kind of the the scales within different different regions, like how does that work now? And and then and Caroline, you mentioned it with people moving, right? So I'm, I'm you know, in the in the Denver metro area, where you know the the price point here is significantly different if you just go one state over, right? So, what does that happen when an employee moves? All of those types of HR types of challenges, I think, is stuff that, that organizations are trying to get their heads uh, wrapped around and how they handle that. Uh, obviously, the the benefits from an employee flexibility standpoint, it's you know, you know, from speaking personally, it's nice for me to be able to, uh, you know, not having to worry about uh, getting into the office every day. Uh, I'm certainly more flexible, and in when I can attend meetings, and I work with a lot of people over uh, in, in Europe and in a pack. So to be able to uh, to get in, you know, at 5:30, 6 a.m. in the morning to to join a meeting is something I wouldn't have been able to do uh, if, if we were still going into the offices. Uh, but the challenges there is. You know, how do you enable all these technologies to to have a, a a good end user experience, right? To be able to be as productive as they were when they were in the offices with with everything that that provides, uh, security, data protection, which you know is another topic I think later on, uh, and then and then maybe most interesting that I kind of thought it would be the other way, but but work life balance. I think what we've seen is you know the 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 use case I mentioned before about being on meetings earlier, I think we're seeing employees working more, which isn't always a good thing, right? It's it's harder, I think, to break away when there's not that, uh, you know, that four or five o'clock tits, you got to shut the laptop and go home. There's not that off switch anymore, right? So that's presenting some challenges. Uh, and then, you know, just uh, Caroline, you, you hit on it really well about, you know, collaboration. I think from a technology standpoint, we're doing some really cool things and there's a lot of that things in that space that enable collaboration in maybe ways that we wouldn't have used before. The challenge is you lose some of the, the interpersonal stuff, right? The the coffee room conversations, like some of the, the, the ways that we used to make connections within the organization and, and find out about other things that are going on. You know, today I, I feel a little bit like we, we kind of live within our own bubble within the organization and it's not as easy to kind of span out. So. Those are the challenges in my mind. I, I, just overall, I think we've had a positive experience with it. And I think, uh, you know, at an organization, uh, we've seen that we're a lot more productive working in this model than we maybe thought we were otherwise, which was probably a, a bit of a barrier to, to making this leap in the past. So, uh, Sevi, interested uh, to know what you're seeing kind of throughout the industry uh, within this space. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think just hearing 
all three of you sort of talk about the different aspects that you've experienced. I mean, it's remote working is not just a small thing. It's not just one use case. I mean, I think what we're looking at is a fundamental shift in the in the way we think about work. I mean, what we do, how we do it, where we do it from. And I think, you, you know, I think Lewis touched on it. Remote working essentially isn't anything new. I mean, Citrix has provided technologies to be able to work remotely for some time now. And the technology really wasn't a big barrier. It was largely this notion of presenteeism or trust that's always been there to some degree. You know, I need to see my employees to know that they're working. Or are they really going to work at home? Are they just going to mess around and watch TV and things like that? So that notion of trust, I think it's been great to see that one of the upsides of the pandemic, well, obviously it's a bad situation, the upsides has been that we've been forced into this situation and employers and leaders have realised that, you know what, I can trust my employees. I do have the technology and, yes, we need to sort of probably improve on it, but I, but it can work and I can be productive. Um, and I think it's definitely something that's going to be here to stay. Uh, it may not be full-time uh, remote work for everyone, but I definitely think hybrid and having elements of remote work in everyone's lives is, is going to be something that's positive both from an employee perspective and a employer perspective as well. I think, Caroline, I think one of the things you mentioned as well, just around historically a lot of organisations have focused on improving the the, the digital customer experience. And in many cases, organizations are probably a bit lagging in terms of improving the experience of tools and processes for their own employees. And I think this notion of now remote working, we're all looking for ways to improve and make it easier for people to do what they need to do. And that's why I think it's been great to see a lot more investment in digitizing the internal business processes, the things that employees need to, to work with, the way they interact with applications, uh, the processes that they go through. And, and I think that's going to be something that really drives a, a, a much richer and um, uh, employee experience and ultimately driving a greater level of productivity. Thanks, everyone. I, I thought that was pretty interesting because even though you all rep represent different industries, uh, many of the challenges are common across the industries. And, you know, Louise, obviously, with mining has a, you know, pretty unique perspective in the sense that there are some jobs that will always remain on site. But it's pretty clear that there are many roles that can potentially be remote. And it's really a question of a question of how do we enable those users to work remotely, but by also, but also making sure that uh, you're able to uh, ensure that they remain productive and keep things moving along. So uh, before we move on to the next topic, a quick reminder to all the attendees that there is a chat window. So please post your questions uh, as they come along and then we will answer it in line uh, throughout the session. So now let's quickly move on to the next topic, which concerns the crown jewels for most organizations, which is their employees. And I think you all kind of touched on this already, but let's dig a little deeper. The shift to remote work was a pretty big change for many, uh, as far as the employees go, having to splice work and life as best as they can. However, the general consensus is that productivity has largely stayed the same, if not improved, thanks to technology, especially collaboration tools. So in addition, organizations now look at talent attraction and retention from a whole new lens, with remote work leading to a global talent pool. Caroline, perhaps we can start this topic with you. Can you share your insights? Yeah, certainly. So we, um, I feel very lucky that we were a bit ahead of the curve in um, the digital space. We had been um, in the past, certainly had the, the Citrix virtual desktop for those um, handful of employees that would work remote on occasion. We worked on a big shift to um, get off of our desktops and go virtual. And so with this pandemic, we were able to roll out a brand new technology um, of, of the Citrix cloud to put it in people's hands so they felt they could work anywhere. There was no difference between me working in the office or me working at home. So it, it was a great time for us to do that. Um, so we had the technology the employees felt very much that they were one in the same, um, no, ma no matter where they were. They, um, the biggest challenge that we've seen with, with some of our employees is one, brand new employees. How do you onboard a fully remote employee? 
in the past, we bring them into the office for a couple of weeks and get to know people and introduce them and take them to lunch. And that's been a difficult um, shift. And so we've adapted, um, but making those employees feel like they are part of the team and the culture has um, has definitely been something we're gravitating to. The employees um, who never thought they would work remote or have the um, the space to do so, or their young children, or um, that has been something we've all adjusted to too. We've been very lucky that we've been able to give alternate work arrangements where needed. Um, the productivity has not in any way, shape or form declined. And um, to what I think everybody's alluded to, it has increased and we try to balance, is that because you're working more, right? That two hours you spent in the car, um, you're not doing that anymore. Um, one of the big challenges is, and, and I'm sure you all know, trying to find a time to meet and get three people or six people together is challenging. Everyone's calendar is blocked. It's worse. It's worse now because every time I want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, we're putting a calendar um, invite on. And so breaking down the walls of it's okay to just call someone out of the blue. You don't have to set up a meeting. That's a, um, a shift that we're not used to having technologies, um, such as, uh, you know, teams or zoom or whatever it is you choose to do your collaboration with has been super beneficial to, um, chatting or, you know, just reaching out and calling, but people aren't comfortable doing that because they think you're busy. And so that's been one of the challenges we're, we're facing. Um, it, it's, it's one that it's tough to get over because you don't want to feel like you're bothering someone. If I walk by your desk and see your, you know, you look over at me, then it's okay to talk. Um, we um, have shifted to many, many cloud solutions and where they existed, we didn't take full advantage of them. And the employees are much um, more technically savvy, I think, than they thought they would be. Um, many of our um, employees would come in and do their job and they use the technology they have. And now their, their world has opened up to this um, collaboration space, um, um, virtually. And so it's been a lot of fun engaging them, um, virtually and having them, um, ask questions or make suggestions. One of the things we learned from an IT perspective is what their perspective is, what's easy to me and how I explain stuff. Um, that they don't use very often to get them over a hump is a very different conversation today. They're, they're much more, um, um, I don't want to say vocal in a negative sense, but they're willing to have um, more detailed conversations with us because it is part of their life now. That technology, that virtual technology is critical to their success. And so it, it makes for a very different type of conversation. Um, it's been a lot of fun to see um, the kids or the dogs or the animals or um, just understanding um, their personal life. The balance that that people have been so grateful for um, is is worth more than I ever thought it would be. The fact that um, um, you can do run out to your, do your grocery shopping or run out to do something, um, because you're five minutes, you know, you're at home versus your, um, office that's an hour away. So you can do that on your lunch. It's invaluable. And our employees appreciate that. So their experience has absolutely shifted. Um, I'm excited to get back to hybrid more because I think, um, like many of you, if you're like me, I'm dying to get out of the house. And, um, I've been, I, you know, I've been personally back in the office once a week and it's been great. And there's definitely some things that, um, you, you lose when you're not fully in the office, but the hybrid has been great. And the employees appreciate, 
um, what is offered to them. They appreciate the technology. They're learning different skills. And so one thing I, I will share, because we are a financial institution and we have branches, we have um, a couple of hundred employees that work at our branches. And when, when COVID hit, those were all shut down. We were 100% able with the technology to shift them into other roles. We gave them certain access and they were able to support our call center, which they don't do because they're face to face with the members. And as you can imagine, the call centers um, volume increased significantly. They were able to support our um, lending side or our mortgage volumes um, because they had the tools and technology to do that. So their experience um, has been very, very positive and they've gotten to try some things they never would have. So um, it's been, it's been fun. So I will turn it over to Brett. I will stop talking. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, no, I agree with, with everything there. And especially one of the things you touched on there at the end about, uh, I think what I've noticed from talking with people is there's, I think, a bit of surprise that the uh, that as many people have enjoyed working in this model as maybe we would have thought, including myself, right? I didn't think there's, there's certainly been some things on a personal level that uh, I would have never got to experience had I been going into the office every day. So I think, you know, you kind of gain a different perspective uh, over the last year that that maybe we otherwise wouldn't have, but, uh, you know, kind of leading to a comment I made on, on, on uh, with the last question about the, the natural progression of things. I think this is one of those two in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the workforce, how the workforce is changing, right? I've been hearing for years, right, that the younger workforce, you know, they prefer to have more flexibility, right? They're not the, the, the type that wants to come into an office every day. They prefer the hybrid model. Um, and we're definitely seeing that. And, and I think, uh, you know, we've certainly used that as a recruiting tool, uh, it, you know, back to the, the hiring flexibility that I mentioned last time. But I think that what's going to be interesting to see, and, you know, we're already seeing a little bit is, is, is what's next, right? Because, uh, you know, the saying that, that, that we're going to give the flexibility to work remotely is nothing unique anymore, right? So it's no longer, uh, uh, you know, a differentiator for us. So uh, so in my mind, my head goes to the technology. So what is going to be the differentiator, right? And, and to me, it, it's tools, right? Um, so, you know, allowing employees to, to work remotely is one thing, but giving them the tools to be productive uh, is a whole nother thing, right? So, so more a shift more towards like BYOD type models, giving employees more choice in the, in the, the actual hardware they're using to get their jobs done. Um, you know, those types of things are things that I think have, have got renewed focus that, that maybe otherwise uh, uh, wouldn't have in the last year. Uh, and then with that, obviously comes the, you know, the, the thing that hasn't changed, right? It is as you're now able to consume applications from everywhere, you know, even before COVID, we kind of had this, um, you know, this, this forward looking uh, vision of it's like, how do we make, all of this stuff consumable, right? Because there's so many different ways that people are consuming applications now, either, you know, SaaS apps, local apps, uh, mobile apps, all that kind of thing. So uh, for me, it's always been, the, you know, that's kind of been the fun part of the challenge is how do you kind of bolt all these things together and give somebody a productive uh, a user experience? And that's never an easy answer, especially, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, you kind of look at the, the legacy, the workforce, as I would call it now, where everybody was going into an office, everything was installed locally on your PC. Uh, you may be accessing some stuff that's running in the day data center, but that, that kind of two-tiered model was pretty simple to manage, right? The end user experience, everything was right there. Now all that stuff is just getting separated out. And then you add the complexity of now removing the user from the, you know, the physical location that they're normally from it, it presents a whole another set of challenges so you know when i hear employee experience it's it's the two parts it's it's one about you know does the employee enjoy working for your company you know and the flexibility that that provides but then the other part is you know are they enjoying the the, the tooling and then are you giving them everything that that they need to to be as productive as they can be so uh you know that's kind of where where our focus is, has shifted over the last last year for sure so Louis, do you have anything to do you want to add to that Luis, you might be muted. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I always forget to unmute. Uh, so I was saying, yes, in, uh, in, um, I had got uh, mixed feelings from uh, our workforce, right? I mean, uh, uh, we probably, uh, you know, in comparison to, uh, to um, um, uh, Greg and, and Brett and, uh, and uh, Caroline, uh, a lot of our workforce is in remote locations in uh, countries like uh, Ghana or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, in uh, Suriname, for example, right? So I, I have heard mixed feelings, right? I mean, there's a lot of people that will love to, uh, to work from home. There's a lot of people that, that uh, miss the, inter the social interactions. They miss to go back to the office. They miss to have the meetings in person. And, uh, and you know, it takes a toll on them, right? I mean, uh, I think as a leader, 
um, we have the responsibility to be continuously checking on their well-being. And, uh, and uh, something that I noticed at the beginning of the pandemic is uh, suddenly I realized that I was spending uh, more time with uh, my direct reports and uh, my first layer of uh, direct reports. And uh, uh, somehow I was neglecting I mean, the entire organization, right? I mean, I didn't have that many chances to interact uh, you know, like like Brett said, right? I mean, just walking down the uh, the, the hall and having a, a, a coffee with uh, with uh, somebody in the uh, uh, in the hallway, right? I mean, uh, you miss all those social interactions, right? So uh, we had to start coming up with ideas into how to reach out to the entire group. Uh, we started doing uh, you know virtual coffees, virtual happy hours with teams. I'm still having uh, one on ones with uh, uh, with uh, people from different groups in my uh, in, in in my team, and uh, that is start building a different kind of relationship with your direct reports, their direct reports, and and, and so forth, right? So a more townhouse. Uh, to communicate, we start using more tools to, for collaboration. Like uh, uh, we took advantage of a lot of the Office 65 tools that we had in our uh, in our tool set that we really weren't that big into. Like Jammer, for example, we went from barely using Jammer to now it's like one of the biggest uh, used tools in the organization to just share ideas and and and, and, and communications. Uh, also, uh, the uh, circumstances of everyone in the organization were different. Uh, it's a lot different for somebody to work out of Denver, even. Uh, in a remote neighborhood from Denver, I mean, you will get good Wi-Fi, good network, good connectivity. When you're in Ghana or Suriname or middle of of, uh, of uh, the Patagonia in Argentina, right? I mean, your internet is probably not very good, right? And then you're not set up as a family to uh, to have a home office, to have a, a big bandwidth, to be able to do video conferencing seven hours, eight hours a day, right? So uh, uh, I think all those factors start changing the way that we had to be more flexible. We had to also as an IT department to start coming up with other ideas, like... Um, and, you know, do we allow um, a, a multiple types of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of video conferencing except the ones that we were uh, officially using? We had to open up to, uh, to um, all kinds of video conferencing. We had to open up to uh, people using uh, tools that were more prominent in uh, certain regions of the world than others, right? I mean, uh, uh, like um, even for messaging and, uh, and uh, allow some, some uh, uh, even our cybersecurity posture had to change a little bit because of things that we were... Uh, Against in the past, now we have to. Now they're in a necessity, so now we have to open up to them and uh, and uh, figure out if there's a, um, if there's a role for them to play in the organization. Uh, also with Citrix, right? I mean, uh, we have people that are working so remote and uh, their connections are so bad that we had to even uh, start considering moving more applications into the uh, into the workplace and uh, making them available via Citrix so they could uh, they could have a better user experience. So. Uh, um, a lot of that, uh, um, you know, the interoperability between all the systems and uh, making sure that we could uh, that, that we could uh, uh, provide them with a good user experience globally has significantly changed the way that we operate. Uh, also, from a from a talent, right? I mean, uh, you also notice. Um, I mean, it, it, it's hard for people sometimes to just work from home. I mean, we think that that we say that we all equally are more productive, which is true. But also, I, I found a lot of people in my uh, in my team started getting exhausted. They were working more hours. Um, you know, uh, some of them, uh, I mean, depression could hit them, right? I mean, uh, um, uh, not being able to, to social interact. I mean, we're so, uh, humans are social beings, right? And uh, and uh, these have taken a toll on them, right? So uh, I think we need to find a good balance as as the vaccines is, is deployed and, uh, and people start going back to, to work. I agree with you, George, that uh, that uh, uh, work from home is going to be something that's permanent and there's something that's going to be here to stay. But um, I think hybrid model in which you still have the ability to have some days a week where you interact with your with your staff or you are in an office setting are going to be important as well from uh, from uh, people's well being. Something we shouldn't uh, uh, undermine, uh, underestimate. Thanks, uh, thanks, Luis. And, uh, yes, and if I could me. just add to Luis's comment. Um, one of the things with employees working from home that has also been a challenge for us is putting together standards of what their home network needs to look like um, from a you know bandwidth, from an internet, um, what, the, what types of, you know, th th what they need there. And not everybody had that up to speed. So there was a lot of HR conversations around um, what we do to get them a hard phone because Sometimes their cell service was not um, what it needed to be to communicate, you know, to, to connect or to connect through um, with all the different systems, especially when you have every person on the block or in your condo building all working from home, sucking up the bandwidth in the area. And so um, lots of challenges on the HR side from a technology um, 
infrastructure perspective at home that they're not used to having in the office. Um, certainly able to overcome a lot of it, but we continue to work through some of those challenges with certain employees who may live in very, very remote areas um, or have, have poor communications carriers to get that um, over the hump. So that, that's a good point, Luis. I mean, we had to start experimenting with uh, Starlink, with the uh, low orbital uh, satellites that uh, just got released. And, uh, and uh, we are a, probably one of the first mining companies that, uh, that are starting to test with that and, and uh, test technology and see if we can deploy it. I mean, they're very small antennas and uh, now we're getting some great success. So maybe something you guys uh, can, can start thinking about. That's, that's great, Luis. Um, Safi, is, does this all align with what you're hearing from customers? Safi, are you muted? Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think there's so many different aspects to this. You know, when I think about productivity, for example, you know, a lot of people, a lot of analysts, everyone talks about productivity is the same or, or greater. But my question is always at what cost? Um, you know, and I think there's a very real human factor to all of this. And I think this whole experience of remote working and as all of the guys have mentioned, it's actually reminded us of, of the human in all of us and the need for social interaction and, and connection. I think the challenges around productivity, especially in a remote environment, is that employees need to feel that they can disconnect and that they don't need to show that they're super responsive because people may try and overcompensate the lack of a physical office and physically seeing their team and feel that they need to immediately respond to an email or always be available to take that call or do that virtual meeting because they don't want to be seen to be not working. And I think Caroline, you touched it on as well. I think it's really important that we find that balance. You know, make sure that employees know that, you, you know, we're supporting them. It's okay to have a break um, and, and make sure that they're not um, taking that time that's saved from commuting and replacing it with more virtual meetings. Um, you know, replace it with something else, exercise, gym, time with the family. It's really important that we find that balance because, you know, this type of operating around the clock is not sustainable and you're just going to burn out your employees ultimately. So I think it's supported. I mean, it's great that productivity has been going. We've, uh, we've been allowed businesses to continue to operate in this lockdown, but I think it's going to be important to find that balance. And I think the other aspect is, and Brett, I think you touched it on, on it when we were talking before is just the being able to broaden the talent pool that, that when we think about hiring, because historically, as you mentioned, you know, we've generally only hired people or looked for people that lived within proximity to an, an office location or a work hub. Whereas now that's really off the cards. I mean, you know, we have opened ourselves up to people that could live anywhere. And I think it allows us to tap into all these new pools of workers that we historically may not have been able to leverage. You know, people... Uh, uh, who have perhaps taken time away from work to look after uh, children or sick parents. You know, they're not able to commute into the office, but they can work part-time from home. You know, all this knowledge and experience that goes when people retire from full-time work, they still can operate if it was casual or part-time. So I definitely think there's a, a whole new world in terms of how we think about uh, hiring people and, and and where we get talent from. Um, and I think that's going to open up new avenues for consideration around where people live. Uh, it was something that we touched on before, but I wanted to raise, I mean, here in Australia, Citrix Australia had, had recently done a survey looking at the impact to housing of, of remote working. And we actually found that 35% of people had either already moved out of the city or had planned to move out of the city. I mean, that's huge. That's like a third of, of people. So I definitely think a lot more people are going to consider moving. I think, Caroline, you touched on this, and I, I think it's going to be better for everyone in terms of being able to find that work-life balance, reconnect with their families and themselves and get some time for themselves, while at the same time making sure they're delivering on their work requirements as well. Thanks, Safi. I think you summed it up well. So what I, you know, if I were to just uh, recap, it's you know, what we've learned as part of the pandemic is remote work has good and bad. For the most, lots of great things to take advantage of. Uh, people appreciate the, the, the work-life balance that they're able to uh, engage in as a result of remote work and the flexibility it gives them. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that employers need to worry about. For, for instance, uh, employee burnout is more important now than ever before, a very important issue. Meeting fatigue is very real. So employ, employers need to think a lot more about 
how do we circumvent some of those issues? Because in a remote world, employees want to, you know, want to still remain visible and show that they're doing work and maybe they uh, over rotate and try to work even more or spend more hours in front of the screen to kind of remain visible. And so employers need to make sure that they communicate that they trust their employees uh, and um, make it clear that their well-being, employees' well-being is important to them. All right, so I think we can move on to the next topic, which is uh, another important topic, that's security. So right at the start of the pandemic, most organizations were forced to relax their security policies to make sure users could get back to work quickly and their productivity was not impacted. But in the process, they made themselves vulnerable to some degree. We also learned from cybersecurity vendors that threats are on the rise since the pandemic hit with attackers adapting to new digital habits and becoming more successful at targeting vulnerable organizations. With users no longer being confined to the four walls of an office that was easier to protect, concepts like zero trust, this notion of never trust but always verify has become more and more prevalent. How has your outlook to security changed as a result of the pandemic? And Brett, maybe you can kick us off on this one. Yeah, sure, I guess I, I would say that you know, I, I certainly talk to security a lot more than I did uh, the prior to, to everybody working from home. So uh, our two sides of the organization are uh, uh, we've kind of blended into one, so to speak. Uh, you know, I guess in my mind, from a security standpoint, I, I think these are uh, you know kind of going going back to one of the themes I've been using. I, I think these are all challenges we saw coming, right? Because this is where the technology was leading us, right? I mean, uh, you know, every we we got into this space because of the flexibility to application to access applications and desktops from any device, any location. You know, that whole mantra that that, that we've been talking for for the last decade. Uh, but I think now that it's become a reality on such a large scale. I think the biggest change for us internally is maybe some of those efforts like zero trust you talk about that were maybe, I don't want to call them nice to have, but there's, there was always other priorities, right? Other things that, that required us to, to look at. I, I think from a security standpoint, now that's become, you know, top of the list type of uh, type of things, um, especially as like, you know, because it's always a, a balancing act, right? I, I mentioned a, a bit ago about, you know, trying to make the technology work so it's a seamless end user experience. But doing so usually presents challenges, right? That you know the the easiest way to do it is probably the less secure, right? So uh, trying to find that balance, and, and especially in an organization like ours, which you know our our product is our data, so there's always uh, scrutiny around how we're protecting that and and making sure we're doing everything possible to uh, not just limit the known threats, but try to do, be forward looking and 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 kind of you know try to uh, anticipate some of the things that are coming in the future. As you said, George, I mean, it's just every day you see a new type of an exploit that you're like, well, I wouldn't, you know, uh, never would have thought of that. Or, you know, that, you know, that's the type of stuff we haven't seen before and you have to be able to react so quickly to it. Uh, on the flip side, though, I think a lot of the technologies we've been looking at for for years, and, and I, I certainly put Citrix in, in, in this uh, in that bucket. I think give us more tools than we would have had otherwise, right? I mean, I think uh, being able to adapt certain security policies based on how users are accessing and being, you know, like those smart access type policies. I think that is exactly the types of solutions that we, that we look to implement now for uh, you know the, the workforce that you know it varies from person to person now, right? It's not easy to even put people into a small number of categories now, like everybody has something unique about the way they're working. Uh, so I think you need that, that flexibility in your tool set to, to be able to uh, meet that. So uh, I, again, I, the, the biggest challenge I think for us has just been prioritizing that work now and, and making sure we get the, the right resources to, to not only focus on it, to, but to uh, you know, be able to implement those kinds of things in a, uh, in a rapid time scale. So uh, that's my thoughts. Uh, Luis, any, any thoughts from you? Sure. Uh, well, in our in our situation in mining, right? I mean, we also have to add the complexity of the operating uh, technology um, as a network segments, right? I mean, we have uh, a lot of industrial networks, SCADAs, PLC, DCS systems that we have to support, right? And uh, uh, this whole working from uh, remote uh, in like before it was pretty easy, right? I mean, you completely segregated those networks, you block them out, you firewall them in, and uh, you know the only way to access them was to uh, physically be at the control room. You know? Fantastic, everybody's happy. Now that you have the experts working from uh, from home, how do you uh, and how do you give them access below the DMC zone uh, without uh, you know exposing yourself or opening yourself to uh, to new threats, right? So that's been a new aspect of uh, a new challenge that we have been uh, experiencing. I mean, uh, we've been using uh, uh, some of the tools that are available there and, uh, and uh, to. Um, properly do this in a secure fashion, but uh, it had uh, certainly made my cybersecurity team a little bit more creative in the ways they operate. And uh, creativity was not exactly one of their <laughs> the, uh, their, their key characteristics, right? So um, uh, we're certainly trying to look into better ways to uh, to uh, provide tools to our work, 
uh, and being able to continue doing the work even if they're not at the control room. Um, other areas of, uh, of uh, challenge, right, is, uh, is zero trust, right? I mean, now you have more people working from all these locations and, uh, and uh, we're using uh, more smart tools like, uh, you know, and, and even uh, AI uh, uh, tools to uh, identify patterns, right? And uh, I think that's what is allowing us to uh, better detect. So we're trying to move more into the detect detection and early response than, uh, than, uh, uh, than our original plan, which was a little more protection and, uh, and, uh, and uh, prevention, right? I mean, we're... we're uh, certainly looking more into uh, instant response uh, capabilities and building those capabilities internally within our team. So, Carolyn, you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah so um, thank you. There, there's, I think we're all a lot in the same boat. And so I echo everything that Brett and Lee said. Um, two things I want to touch on that security um, always had in their minds, but it's much more prevalent now. Um, asset management that many of our assets have now left the building um, before, right? Before you came in and, and your hardware was there and everything was local to it. And so the security footprint was very different. So we've taken a very hard look at our asset management controls, um, not only physical, but the remote management of those devices that have left the building. And the second piece that um, we were able to really control because we didn't have a lot of remote workers where you had the one person that was having a home delivery and they worked at home um, is printing outside of the office. Um, and we've had to lock that down pretty tight um, and only open where, um, where it's controlled. Um, but the other piece that everybody had to go home I don't, um, I no longer control the space you, you work in before I was able to, um, say these are the requirements of the space you're working in locked door and all, all the things that go along with it. Um, and we didn't have that anymore. And so the physical controls that go within your workspace had to go home with you. And so, um, we have to balance, um, what we can enforce and what we can mitigate. And so that's been a big shift for our security team, the cyber stuff, the applications that we, we do that, we continue to refine it. It's always on the forefront of our minds, but this was a big shift to the volume of the physical um, security of, of so much leaving our um, four walls of the office building. And, and it's going to continue to be a, um, an ongoing conversation since Hybrid is a thing. I, I would I would venture to say most of us are going to have very few, if any, employees that are fully in the office five days a week all the time from now on. So those are the two things, the printing and physical security and asset management. I guess that's three that I would um, say. Safi, you want to take us home on this one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Carol. And I think you raised some really good points around, you know, even simple things like printing and physical security. I was... Um, listening to, uh, to a webinar from an analyst firm here in Australia called Ecosystem 360. And the way they described how you should be thinking about remote workers is thinking about it as a branch of one. All the things that you need to set up a branch, security, physical security, IT security, printing, connectivity, all those different elements need to be considered for, for now people working from home. It's not just providing them with a laptop and a, a VPN connection and saying, here you go. And I thought that's a, a really good consideration because often we forget about those things. We assume that we've, we've given them a laptop, a, a Zoom account or whatever it may be, and off they go. And there's a lot more to it, you know, making sure that they're set up for success. Um, I think on the security side, I mean, this is going to be an area that takes more and more, um, more and more focus. Um, if you think at about the pandemic and what it's meant for organizations as consequences, you know, we've seen an accelerated shift to cloud and we're sort of moving more resources, applications, infrastructure. We're building new applications in the cloud now as well. Uh, with remote working, we're pushing people out of the corporate networks into their home networks as well. So we're ending up with a very, very distributed working environment, both from a back-end IT perspective and a front-end end user perspective or an employee perspective. And that's going to take a lot of rethinking and, and, and refining how we approach security because you're no longer bound by a secure data center and secure corporate networks. You've got people 
working from anywhere, from their home networks, which may be contending with, you know, children playing games and downloading and how do you ensure the performance and security of those networks. Um, you've got people accessing things outside of the corporate data center in public clouds as well and, and how you secure that. So I definitely think there's, there's a need for a lot more security. As George, you touched on, I think, in the beginnings of the pandemic, we all just wanted to quickly put a remote working solution out there and many organizations did take some shortcuts on the security aspect with the interest of we just got to get the business running. And what we're seeing is that organizations are going back and now addressing those gaps, really reinforcing the security postures there. Um, uh, Luis, I think you talked about the visibility aspect and I think that's incredibly important. Um, I think for when you think about security and breaches, I think everyone's going to suffer an, an, an impact or an attack or a breach of some sort. I think the important thing is having the visibility and a plan for response. I think that's the, the best way organizations can um, can prepare for that. And I think finally, I think, you know, when we, you know, we touched on the last topic around employee experience, I think it's always important that we don't look at security as a siloed aspect we, where we just do whatever the security teams are telling us. It's important we find the balance between security and experience um, and to make sure that we don't swing the pendulum either way too far and, and find a, a happy medium that you know empowers people to do what they need to do and they have the right tools and access, but at the same time, we're making sure they're protected as well. Thanks, Safi. Again, it's great to hear everyone's perspective on security and how that, that has also changed quite a bit. Overall, a fascinating discussion, one that highlighted how regardless of the industry you're in, leaders are now faced with the challenge of reimagining work and adjusting many of their strategies. It is also apparent that providing the employees the ability to get work done securely while ensuring the best possible experience is more critical than ever before to ensure productivity and also retaining and attracting the best talent out there within this global workforce that we are part of. Any final thoughts that each of you would like to share with the audience? And I'll maybe start with Caroline this time. Sure, so this is gonna be an evolving and ever-changing environment. Um, and, and honestly, ripping off the Band-Aid like it happened last March was probably the best thing because sometimes um, it takes a little longer to change, but we're here and um, it, it's, it's exciting and um, would love to hear all of your perspectives. And one thing I love about these types of things is we meet new people and you get to see new faces and you now have new contacts to reach out to. So um, we're all here for the same reasons. And so thank you for, for uh, letting me share. Thanks, Caroline. Louise, you want to go next? Uh, sure, George. Uh, well, um, basically, I think this is our time to shine. I mean, I think IT organizations around the globe, this is our opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, downside is, uh, is uh, this is our, uh, our opportunity to really be change agents and uh, change the way that our firms operate and, uh, and to find those cost savings and find the opportunities for, uh, for organizations to evolve into a more uh, uh, dynamic workforce. So um, I'm really looking forward to what 2021 is going to bring us and, uh, and uh, hopefully the years to follow. So welcome any additional questions you guys may have. Thanks, Luis. Brett? Yeah, I definitely echo that, our time to shine, right? I think if you would have uh, asked me even a year ago what uh, the top priorities are that we'd be working on today, I, I wouldn't have been anywhere close, right? Uh, uh, which is a good thing for us of the, that are in this space. So, uh, you know, I tend to be a bit of an optimist. So I, I like the fact that this has brought on new challenges because, uh, you know, I think that's uh, what we do, right? We we fix things, and in these particular challenges, is is you know, there's no one right way to solve it, right? And that's what I like too. So, so kind of analyzing all these different tools and trying to put uh, together solutions that that help our organizations and our employees advance is, uh, you know, personally speaking, that's, that's why I got in the business. So, uh, definitely looking forward to whatever this year has to bring. And uh, yeah, and thank you for having me. This has been good. Thanks, Brett. And then Safi, maybe you can bring it home with a Citrix perspective on all this. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's interesting, Caroline, what what you said about ripping the bandage off. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of reports out there that talk about this pandemic pushing organisations forward almost a decade in terms of mindset, in terms of their use and adoption of technology, changing work practices and all of that. And I think it's a really exciting time. You know, I definitely think IT teams around the world have shined, you, you know, not just now, but you go back to when the lockdown first happened 
how much effort went in 24 by 7 by IT teams around the world to mobilize, build infrastructure, build solutions, whatever it may be, to make things work and keep businesses operating. So, um, you know, pat on the back to everyone in the IT industry who's done that. You know, I think from a Citrix perspective, what I find interesting, I mean, yes, I've been here like 11 years, but I've been sort of involved with Citrix like many of us for, for quite some time. And it sort of takes me back to what Citrix has always been about, right? I mean, we, we've always had this vision that people should be able to work from anywhere um, and any time and, and any device and that work is not a place. And, and I feel now more than ever that vision is actually spot on. I, I, I think it allows us to, you know, as I touched on, remind us about the human factor, make sure we've got that work-life balance. I think we've all gotten caught up in that whole routine of work and we've built our whole lives around work. We haven't built it around our life. Our, our lives centre around commuting to work, doing work, coming home and rinse and repeat. And I think we've got a really great opportunity to to find ourselves, re rediscover ourselves and, and, and really reassess the priorities in our life while still doing work, but also making sure we're we're committing and, and meeting our commitments for the other aspect in our in our personal in our personal lives. So again, really enjoyed the discussion and, and, and meeting all of you and open to any questions. Once again, I'd like to thank you or thank all the attendees for joining us on this webinar. Uh, I hope you found this to be an insightful session. And a special thanks to all of our amazing panelists for the for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us and share their thoughts. We look forward to seeing you all on the next strategy and practice session. Stay tuned and thank you very much.